Hi there. Welcome to Business Leadership Podcast. In this podcast, I interview successful business leaders and industry experts to help you grow your business. I truly believe that sometimes single insight can completely change your business directions and allow you to achieve your business goals. In this episode, my guest is founder of Morph Consulting, and she's also an author of The Wisdom of Transition, Navigating Change at Work, and she won Sound Advice Book Award for Best New Author 2020. She's a leadership consultant, executive coach, and thought leader, and uh, she partnered with a very successful organization for the last 30 years to grow their leaders and guiding them in the midst of professional and organizational change and transitions. She's designed, facilitated, and uh, delivered various leadership courses, uh, programs uh, for many organizations such as Colorado Water Professionals and American Company. She's been a frequent presenter at various national and regional conferences. Now we had a discussion on a many interesting topics and as you know for the last few years during this destruction we've been going through so many changes whether it's on an organization level or on a personal level and she talks about how to avoid some of those negative impact on, on a, yourself and your teams also on your business as well. You know she uh, walks us through her transition model and uh, what, you know, how to avoid some of those challenges that, that you're going to come across and also how to look for some of those blind spots that you're not aware of when you're going through this transition and changes. So without further ado, please welcome my guest, Cheryl Benedict. Hi guys, welcome to Business Leadership Podcast. Today my guest is Cheryl Benedict. Uh, Cheryl, you know, um, your expertise in the leadership, you've been helping leaders uh, for many, many years, you know, even even get better at what they already, you know, that they're doing very well. So I'm looking forward to a discussion, looking forward to learning from you. You know, I just gone through your book. There's so much wisdom. So I'm looking forward to sharing that with the audience. So thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure. So so just walk us through, Cheryl. What do you see that, you know, for the last couple of years, we've gone through so much on a family level, a personal or business level. Where do you see that, you know, if, if you can pinpoint a couple of things where leaders are, you know, uh, what are the areas they're trying to get better at or what are they struggling with? You know, uh, where, where you see, what are your thoughts on the last couple of years, all that, all that we've gone through? I would say the last couple of years, all of us been, have been faced with unprecedented change. Uh, certainly with the uh, advent of COVID, everyone mm-hmm. had their life turned upside down. And uh, I think it was fortuitous that I wrote a book and got it published right as COVID was happening because it's all around uh, mm-hmm. how do you navigate the psychological and emotional aspects of change? And then personally, how do you navigate transition? So maybe yeah. because I'm dialed in mm-hmm. to that particular aspect or demographic or topic, it just seems like the people running companies were dealt with things they've never had to face before. Mm-hmm. Like, do we do we have our entire workplace be remote? Do we bring them back? How do we navigate masks? There was an executive order in the states that co- the companies were looking at having to enforce mandatory wearing of masks. Never before mm-hmm. have leaders of companies had to deal with this level mm-hmm. of. Uh, craziness. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and the same time, you know, decision making got lot, lot, you know, there's the times taken out of decisions, right? So, you know, it, it's it's not that you sitting there and making decision; it just forced upon you, and you just have to figure out how to deal with those changes, right? That's right. I even had a leader that I coach send me an article around decision fatigue. Uh, that it's just been too much, mm-hmm. too many monumental decisions. Uh, in crisis-oriented environments and having to respond with the very best decision, the very best um, solution. So Mm -hmm. I think it's been, well, I I imagine you would echo Mm -hmm. extraordinary times to lead. Definitely. Um, you know, the change has always been difficult for anybody, right? So, so this is the one of the, I, you know, I don't, we've been talking for years, even before COVID that, you know, change is always threatening, it's always difficult in any time. And your book definitely, you know, walk us through that change, you know, the process of change I, I'm, I'm talking about that, that it's been difficult even before COVID, but now we just taken a t- time out of it and the change is just so fast that, that we have to deal with. Where you see that some of the challenges, you know, you, you know, uh, people people struggling with it's just a speed of change, it's just too many changes. What, what are some of the areas, you know, that that you know, when the process of change comes in, how, how do people handle that? Uh, I w- I think it would be important to articulate that 
at least from my research, change mm. is something that happens to us externally, but then it triggers this internal response called transition. And uh, there's a lot mm -hmm. of terrain to travel. Um, mm. Transition always begins with an ending. Uh, yeah. It'll never be the same again. I'll never be the same again. And all of the requisite emotions that go hand in hand with that mm -hmm. until finally we're able to accept the change, maybe not like it, okay. uh, but find a way to accept it. And then we move upwards in the model to a new beginning. But I think that that takes time. I don't think you can just flip a switch from the ending to a new beginning. Usually there's a, a fair amount of time that occurs. And so when you've got a lot of changes happening simultaneously, that means you're at many different stages of transition mm -hmm. with all those changes. And that can be overwhelming because the, the signature of going through transition is that you don't feel on top of your game. Yeah. Uh, and it's very disconcerting to feel like what in the heck is wrong with me? It's as mm -hmm. if 35 to 40% of your normal smarts or bandwidth has been subsumed with a change and you're only operating with 60 to 65% of yourself. Mm -hmm. And and you may experience memory loss, um, uh, difficulty in focusing. I mean, there are physical, emotional, behavioral symptoms that mm -hmm. show up, but but I think when you're dealing with what you're talking about, the ex acceleration of change and so many changes, mm -hmm. it's exhausting yeah. to try to navigate that internally mm -hmm. and the ramifications of that. Well, well, especially when you, as you mentioned that a change started from internally first, right? Before transition, if it's going to be, you know, changing something internally and it's so many changes, how many different ways you can change and adapt internally to those changes? And are you ready for that? That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. And a lot of people probably not ready for it when, when the whole COVID strike, right? So, it's, you know, if it's going to be internal changes, as you know, that whether it's, uh, you know, development or whether it's a perspective change or that takes time, you know, you cannot just change everything internally, you know, very quickly. It takes time. And, and as you mentioned that, you know, it, it's a, you have to, but the time was the one that was taken out of equation. It was just, just, uh, we just had no choice. I guess we have to speed it up. Right. So I think that's what people probably feel a lot of uncomfortable. Absolutely. And the, the the term that was coined during that time was indefinite uncertainty. Like we had uh -huh. no idea if it was going to end, mm -hmm. when it was going to end, and what was it going to look like? Mm -hmm. um, would we be able to hug our friend or our brother, shake hands? Would we be able to go out to eat or go to conferences or even travel? Yeah. All of that was up in the air. Mm -hmm. And uh, um I mean, I don't ever remember any time in my life where I was forced to stay yeah. home. Yeah. That is counterintuitive from a North American standpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, also, I, I, I'm finding my discussion with a lot of business leaders, Cheryl, that, you know, a lot of these you know, leaders, they have to change their roles quite a bit. You know, they may have a one role before that, you know, when the changes happen, that the roles totally change. Now they have a totally different role to play in an organization, right? Some of them they had to take CIO role or CEO roles, you know, yeah. or could be, you know, uh, CTO roles. So different roles change because the change was introduced in a company. Are you finding that, you know, that difficult for business leader to changing their roles or is it just a new norm that we have to adopt different roles as we make a change in our companies? Great question. I think it's looking at your organization and, and deciding where, where is there a gap? Where is there an unmet need and uh, can I step up and fulfill it? Yeah. I love, uh, I mean, it's an old book, but going from good to great. Do you mm -hmm. remember that one? It's a great book. Yeah, great book. Yeah, I mean, it's oldie but goodie. And, and talking about um, level five leaders are the ones that are within an organization. They see a leadership need, an unmet need, and they look around and go, well, okay, I could fulfill that. Mm -hmm. uh, it may not be in my job description, but it's needed. Let me do it. And those are the kinds of leaders that we love. You know, it creates followership when you don't necessarily have the title, but yeah. you see there's a need and you step up in selfless service to fulfill it. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of that. I've seen a lot of heroic behavior um, since COVID. People mm -hmm. um, burning the midnight oil. 
searching for solutions, stretching themselves way beyond Mm -hmm. they ever thought they would need to stretch. It's been very impressive. Yeah, you know, same time they got to figure a solution, same time they got to take care of the people reporting to them as well, as well, right? People at home, they're going through so many challenges, it could be family challenges, could be health challenges, you know, could be financial challenges. We don't know how many challenges people are dealing with. So not only we got to figure out solutions and move companies forward, but we also got to be mindful and helping these people out, right? So who knows what they, you know, challenges, what they're going through and, and help them to, to excel at whatever, the, whatever they're doing. Well, and in my role as a leadership consultant and executive coach, part of my job is to ask, Gurmeet, what are you up against? Like, what are you up against personally, professionally? Mm -hmm. What's really hard? Um, And then to talk through a solution. um, Often it involves how are you taking care of yourself? What have you built in that's replenishing? Like, I know you get up at zero dark 30 and run. Mm -hmm. Like, you fit fitness into um, your life because it's a a huge commitment. And so that's much the kind of conversation I have. What are you doing for fun? What are you doing to recharge your battery? What are you doing to replenish Mm -hmm. so that you can go back in um, with fully armed and ready to do good work because I worry about the leaders that aren't doing that, Mm -hmm. that are running on fumes because it's much easier to get triggered, uh, much easier for the stress to get to you Mm -hmm. if you're not taking care of yourself. So a lot of what I've been talking about the last two and a half, three years is replenishing rituals. Mm -hmm. What are the things throughout your day that you can actually plan for that you know will fill your tank so that you can keep going. Yeah, because if you're not taking care of yourself, then how are you going to go help other people, right? You you got to take care of yourself first and you got to be in a state where you can listen, you can you can help people out and, and you can keep your energy high. And, and otherwise, how are you going to do that? So what what are you finding some of the people? Are they changing some of this? You know, I definitely, you know, everybody's have to find their own style, what works for them. For me, as you mentioned, that running works in the morning. Some people read books, you know, they, they do different things. What are you finding, say, in any, any different form of people, you know, trying different, uh, you know, uh, um, items to, to, to deal with, you know, to how, how to, how to get better at what they really do uh, already doing. I think that when people are working more hybrid or more remotely or more work from home, Mm -hmm. people are, uh, boy, it's diverse. Maybe picking up the guitar and playing, uh, playing a favorite song, maybe listening to a song you love, maybe pulling up photos of a family vacation that fills you with, with a joie de vivre. Maybe it's uh, getting your face in the sun for a couple of minutes to drink in the sun and the vitamin D. Uh, I know people who do jumping jacks just to get their energy going. I know people who um, have meditation apps and will quiet their mind for 15, 20 minutes. It's as diverse as the person, yeah. but I think that the thing to ask yourself is, what are the the people or situations that are an energy drain mm-hmm. in my life? And what are the people or situations that are energy gain? And then to be mindful of the people or situations that are a drain. Because mm-hmm. I think we start off the day with a certain amount of energy yeah. and throughout the day it depletes unless you're an extrovert and then social interaction might fill your cup. But for most of us, our energy level starts to dip. And if we're around negative people or, or situations um, that are in fact an energy drain, I think we need to be mindful of that mm-hmm. so that we're not just leaking all of our life force off. Yeah. With a dr- highly dramatic or toxic mm-hmm. individual, rather we're safeguarding, protecting the amount of energy we have, uh, replenishing throughout the day, the goal being to leave work with as much energy as you started with. Because yeah. you don't want to be a flatliner when you're at home. Yeah. You want to, that's a, for most people would report that friends and family are number one. Yeah. So we need to save energy for that. Mm-hmm. So very interesting that you mentioned about, um, you know, saving energy. Is there, a, uh, you know, approach you you recommend doing that, you know, or simply making a list of those, you know, people, hey, these people are going to, or these activities are going to drain my energy and these these activities over here is going to, you know, pump more energy into me. So, I'm, you know, I got to find a balance between those two. Maybe 
you know, um, when my energy is high, I can deal with the, you know, the items are difficult. And when my energy is low, I can deal with. So is there a, a method to it or simply just making a to list and just going about it? I believe making a list is brilliant. I think doing some self-reflection and deciding what are the situations or who is an energy drain. Even just that level of self-awareness and emotional intelligence mm -hmm. is your three-fourths of the way there. So if you know that Mary is a trigger and that for whatever reason you feel criticized in her presence or less than then to be aware of that before you go into yeah. a conversation with mary to do some good self-talk yeah. to remind yourself i am worthy i am good enough um I'm, I, I accept myself i love yeah. myself whatever that might be so that you're prepared ahead of time for a person who who tends to be triggering for you and then mm -hmm. if you want to go to step two ask yourself who does mary remind me of from my past mm -hmm. Ooh, she feels a lot <laughs> like my critical dad yeah. and then do the work you know yeah. do the work of yeah. um understanding where that trigger comes from maybe dissolving it or neutralizing it i mean yeah. there are lots of different stages that you could that you could do but i think yeah. now more than ever knowing the people and situations that feed us that nurture us that that give us vitality and energy um i think it's useful to surround ourselves with yeah. those folks i mean don't you yeah no definitely you know to, to connect with, you know I, I can speak from a personal experience you know white space on my calendar sometime between two meetings it, it could be it could be bringing my energy down you know when i have a white space i'm thinking about you know what what haven't i achieved you know maybe i could do this so i'm just bringing my energy down by talking about that in but if i have a one item by after another one there's no white space i'm going one after another one just tackling items but if i leave a little bit of space in between that i'm just self talking Oh, I need to do this. I'm making a list of all the stuff I missed the whole day or the or over the week that I'm trying to figure out how I'm gonna squeeze that into the time. So, you know, for me, that white space, a little bit in the calendar, is is not, you know usually not good. But I, I think everybody has to find out what is what are those some, some of those items that you mentioned that make a list of those items and then just tackle as as they go through and and uh, find out what gives them energy back. I guess right. And what's fun is we're, we we are different. Like yeah. I love white space. I love when somebody <laughs> cancels and I have a whole hour of uh, um, freedom. Really, yeah. it feels like freedom. Like, yippee, yeah. what do I want to do with this hour? Um, just that pervading sense of spaciousness. Mm -hmm. I love. I read, a, uh, I think it was a, a, a blog podcast podcast by Brene Brown and she talked about she, she and her team were going to take the entire summer off wow. just because they wanted to uh, pause mm -hmm. and reflect and get a sense of hmm, is the vision we have for this organization is mm -hmm. it time to update it and I thought wow to be able to actually take that much time off to revision and remap I, I found that pretty appealing. So it's wow. funny that the white space for you is detrimental Definitely. and white space for me is joyous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, and, and some of those, uh, you know, pauses, uh, what I heard, you know, it could be good for what, what you just mentioned with the Mary and them, but um, you know, definitely a lot of uh, pauses happen. I, I'm not sure if you see that that is people change, you know, the, the big pause happened during this time, this pandemic, that that give people different perspective on things, maybe different career, maybe different jobs, you know, it's better for them, maybe different approach to what they were doing. And that's going to shift a lot of uh, the market, you know, where we're, you know, we're struggling to find a talent is simply because people change the way they were, whatever they were doing before the, before the pandemic. I uh, listened to a chief economist from BMO Harris of Toronto. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said that 5,000 employees from North America did not return to the workplace. And it was either uh, during COVID, um, two income families realized they could do more with less. Mm -hmm. They didn't necessarily need to have two full-time professionals working that in fact, maybe they would explore mm -hmm. uh, alternative sort of scenarios. And, and so the labor shortage that we're experiencing, at least in the States, is profound because mm -hmm. there have been a lot of, I think, quality of life decisions 
that the families have made. Do we want to live here? Do mm -hmm. we want to move someplace else and work 100% remotely? I think it's a interesting times we're in. Mm -hmm. Definitely the, give them a pause a little bit to think it through instead of just going one, you know, um, on, on a daily routine. So very interesting. Let's talk about mindset. You know, one of the items you mentioned in the book is a mindset and the business leaders, you know, um, I talk to is that, you know, um, every time you build, a, you know, set up a goals, even from the, from the, you know, many, many of the books I read, Cardone's book I recently read was, you know, when you achieve your goals and you know, one of the, when you, somebody asked, Hey, what could you have done differently? And it said, well, you know, only made a mistake I made was my, my goal was, I didn't set up my goals big enough. Um, mm. So they were very small. So, you know, definitely it required different mindset, you know, um, and that's where I think a lot of people get stuck that the mindset is very, very narrow. It's not a, as wide, it's not a big enough. So, so you can set up bigger goals and achieve. Where do you think, uh, you know, some of those items that help people to get a right mindset and how do they go about it? And what are your thoughts on that? You know, if they, somebody wants to change the mindset, they want to get, you know, bigger expansion. What, what, what are some of the items they can do to, you know, gain some of the perspective? I mentioned in my book, and I like a lot, the research by Carol Dweck, okay. who wrote a book called Mindset. And mm. she talks about growth mindset and fixed mindset. And okay. it feels like when you're talking about goals that are too small, it feels like it emerges from a fixed mindset, like I am this, I can only do that. It feels mm. more narrow and more constrained. A growth mindset would be, you know, I've never done that before, but I want to try. Would be I nice. want to experiment. Yeah, yeah I want yeah. to experiment. And let's see. And and it's not going to be perfect immediately. I'm going to learn along the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's a far greater sense of engagement with life and a far greater sense of, I think, excitement when you dream big. You know, yeah. you dream big. And so there are loads of tools that I use. I'm very visual. Mm -hmm. So I create a vision board. I've got one right there. Mm -hmm. I create a vision board of everything I want to manifest for the following year. And mm -hmm. I, I have pictures that, that embody that feeling. I have phrases that, that, that articulate that vision. And then I'm open to being surprised. I'm open to uh, even greater goodness flowing in. So I think when we have a growth mindset, we work hand in hand with our greatest good to be able to achieve goals we never even believed were mm -hmm. possible it's just having the the desire and the curiosity i think that gets us started yeah i know um there's there's i think two you know a lot of people talk about having a realistic goals and some people talk about having a much bigger goals that you can achieve it'll take you a long time to achieve so I think there's a both sides to it, but you know, I, I normally set up goals for like five years goals or seven years goal or ten years goal. But a lot of people set up a six months or one year goal. Um, any recommendation? What do you what do you think? Uh, you know that 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 worked for you in in the past? Um, so I'm a assessment nerd. Um, with the Myers Briggs, you're talking like an intuitive thinker, yeah. which is a visionary of change, uh, an architect of what could be, and and a, an intuitive thinker very much is able to think about long-term goals. It's almost yeah. like a, you're hardwired to be able to imagine what are the future possibilities, what could be, where do I want to be in five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. But... If you're a SJ, a sensing judger, those are people that are oriented to the present moment. They're very interested in what is actual, factual, concrete, related to right now. And that's where they, yeah. they blossom. And that's where their genius gets activated. So some people aren't actually able to mm -hmm. do what you do. Some mm -hmm. people, it would be like... Um, Describe what a trip to Mars would be like. It would be so outlandish and so beyond their scope of imagination that you'd, you'd um, leave them sort of staring at you mm -hmm. thinking, what's wrong with me? So when I work with leaders, I find out what is their time span orientation? Are they most comfortable talking about one month, two month, three months, six month? goals and increments or are they I like see. you mm -hmm. well able and conversant strategic able to talk about the future so mm -hmm. i think it's important when you work with leaders to discover 
what their time span is because <clears throat> many of the leaders I work with don't have the innate ability that you do. I see. Yeah, yeah. I, I think a lot, a lot of people, they want to set up a, a shorter goal, but, you know, I try to bring it, I, I think you're absolutely right that it's, it's, a, it's a who you are and, and what your time span is. You know, definitely, uh, definitely when you set up a five years goal, bring it down to monthly activities and weekly what is going to take you there. That's some 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 challenges for me, you know, definitely, you know, because because I look a little further and not, not on current time. But I think uh, you're right. The people who look at a current time, it's probably easy for them to set up daily, weekly activity, what they really want to do instead of looking at the longer term. I think it's just a style. And I think you could help them with that. I mean, that's the gift of of what you bring. I would imagine you could help nudge them mm -hmm. out of their comfort zone with time span and say, what if, you know, what if in five years we could, this will be our BHAG to yeah. go back to going from good to great, our big, hairy, audacious goal. Yeah. Uh, and I bet that would be a role that you could mm -hmm. um, provide yeah. because there are a lot of leaders that, that just don't have that DNA like yeah. you do. Yeah, well, you know, we learn from each other, right? Or I can learn from somebody, you know, who, who's in the present, then I can learn from the short term, what they do, you know, on daily, weekly basis. So I can learn from them and also help them to understand both. You know, it, it's, it's that's how we collaborate. That's how we learn from each other. Mm -hmm. So so let's, let's talk about a little bit of your journey, uh, Cheryl. How did you get so, you know, um, what, what drew, uh, drew, drove you to, to understanding leadership and helping leaders? Like, you know, talk about your journey. How did you get to... Uh, I'll be expert at the leadership. Wow, that's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think I've always gravitated okay. towards working with leaders. I would say that when I became a certified executive coach, all kinds of opened. Um, getting to work with leaders that run companies, I became really clear 15 years ago that my point of entry with an organization is the top, uh, not HR, not OD, but the mm -hmm. president, CEO, chair, and to begin there and then work my way down the organization with leadership development programs and team building and coaching. So mm. I think it's just been an innate attraction to an understanding of what it is to be a leader. Mm. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I, a lot of people talk about, you know, uh, people on top, they're a little bit lonely, you know, they, they're dealing with a lot of that, that stress. What are your thoughts on, is, is that, is that what people are dealing with on a daily basis? You know, there's just a lot of stress that they're trying to get a handle on. There's so many decisions to make so much stress that, you know, that they got to get through. Well, you run your own company. It's yeah. lonely. It is. It's lonely. You're making decisions for uh, a, a myriad number of people and uh, you have to trust your gut you have to trust your ability to analyze and you you know whatever else you bring in so I think it's incredibly isolating and lonely I'm working with a woman now who uh, is going to become the president of a 850 person engineering firm here in Denver um, April 1st Mm -hmm. And then after that, she'll also become the CEO and the chair. And one of the things that I'm trying to get her ready for is how people are going to start to treat her differently. Yeah. Once you take on the mantle of president, it's almost like a force field surrounds you. People who would ordinarily have come into your office to talk about um, normal weekend stuff mm -hmm. suddenly are, ooh, intimidated by the title and I'm warning her not to take that personally yeah as there is a certain um deference or respect that we pay for the leaders of an organization and mm -hmm. that can create even more loneliness mm -hmm. isolation than than would ordinarily be there so it's real I yeah. uh, I warn people before they accept big jobs Mm -hmm. uh, are you ready? Yeah. Are yeah. you ready? And my job is to get them ready. Yeah. You know, one of the, well, I don't know if I, if I, you know, you, you've seen this with other leaders, but one of the things I, I learned over the years, uh, Cheryl, is, you know, that when it was, when we were a small company, you know, we still not as large corporation, smaller company, but, you know, when we were starting out early on and, and, uh, you know, I needed to make a lot of decisions, as you, as you mentioned, and you have to make the decision by yourself. You know, nobody's around you when you're making those decisions. I'm um, not even family members. You, you got to make those decisions by yourself. 
And uh, when I was making the decision, and uh, one thing I learned was that information I need or insights I need to make a decision, I was I was looking at outside, you know, gather information here. I, I didn't have to do that. All that information was within me. You know, I'll have to look inward instead of looking at outward. As I learned that uh, the process of, you know, every time I make a decision, you just have to do a gut check, just look and you know, uh, look internally and find out whatever you need. You already have all the information before you make a decision. More I learned, you know, faster we grew as a company and, and I kind of more started more relying on that process more than looking for information outside. Um, I learned that by 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 chance, by by mistakes, but I don't know if what the, is it is that how business leaders approach the most of the decision would whenever you make a decision, information you already have, you just have to look inward, not outward. Great question. I think often it's a combination of gut knowing inside and then verify with facts or analysis. Um, I work with predominantly engineers, so mm -hmm. they're pretty analytical. Logical um, people. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. They love um, <laughs> data and yeah. research. So I would imagine even the most gut-oriented decision makers I work with probably make sure with with external. Some mm -hmm. people start with external and then finish it off with gut. Other people start with an internal knowing and they often verify it with data. So I've seen both. I see. So external, I understand you can get better with the data. How about internal? The you know, can you get better at that? Um, the, your, your gut feelings and, and your your insights. You know, is there a way? Is there a process to get better at that part? I think that, that I mean, if you've done any business school at all, you know that risk equals reward, and the calculated risk, well thought out where you've analyzed the pitfalls and what are the landmines and what could go wrong, making a risk, um, a calculated risk uh, that fits the organization's risk appetite, mm -hmm. making one of those decisions and then watching it unfold and, and making course corrections along the way. I imagine you learn a tremendous amount about yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, woo, Definitely. I can really trust my gut. That mm -hmm. was bloody brilliant. I want yeah. to do that again. That was fun to yeah. embark on that. So I imagine it's a journey. I don't think that people probably pop out of the womb with a sense of knowing everything that goes into making a risky decision. But I think when you recognize that risk equals reward and that there's a tremendous amount of reward that's flowing in as a result of the risky decision you made, I'm imagining you begin to trust yourself. Like, mm -hmm. ooh, I think my instincts are 98%. And yeah. I think that's, that's a, I am imagining that's a wonderful feeling when yeah. you can trust your inner knowing. And I do think it's a journey. Mm -hmm. Especially when we're scaling up the teams, like we're building a teams, we're hiring people. I mean, you're never going to gather enough information about the person, but right. it's all going to be gut feeling. It's all going to be, you know, that, that one of those prompt food decision. Hey, do I, <laughs> do I, do I have a good feeling about this person or not? Right. So a lot of those hiring decisions are made from, from that angle, not a lot from a data, I guess. Right. But I do have an amazing tool that I'm certified in that's used for hiring. It's the only assessment I know that stands up in a court of law to use for hiring. It'll actually, wow. let's say you had three CFO candidates that you were yeah. excited about. You would give each of them the assessment and it would measure their suitability for being a CFO. And it would provide a level of suitability in the form of a percentage so let's say John is 95% suitable for CFO, according yeah. to all this data. Uh, Sarah is 92% and Mike is 96%. Then you'd have very specific data about mm. all three candidates on 175 leadership traits that are measured as to what is their suitability going to be? So in many ways, it would validate your gut sense. It would also show you where they flip to under stress. Mm -hmm. You would be able to discern their suitability with the team. Okay. So this particular assessment is called the Harrison assessment. I love it. I got yeah. certified in it 15 years ago and 
I actually bring it into all of the leadership development mm -hmm. programs that I have because uh, it shows the essential and desirable traits mm -hmm. for leadership and traits that could hinder your success. I find, and again, remember, well, you work with, you know, IT, technical. Mm -hmm. I work with engineers. They love data. Yeah. Yeah. They love they data. Do. Yeah. So, you know, this this is great. So, you know, so you're testing, I'll, I'll take it as your cultural fit, you're testing a personality fit, you're testing, you know, e even a decision-making process, you're testing all those elements that we can test, uh, you know, um, but with the discussion, I think you're going through all those items to test that stuff, right? And when you're getting ready to hire somebody, it's not just suitability, but it's also eligibility. You know, it's What's their resume look like? What, where do they go to school? What's mm -hmm. their network look like? What what expertise are they bringing? So I don't know how to weight it. I don't know if it's 50% eligibility, 50% mm -hmm. suitability, hard to know. But I do know that with interviews, sometimes it's hard. Very hard, yeah. To get a sense of, is this person going to fit? What are they going to bring the first 90 days? And I think having a tool to validate that um, has given a lot of people peace of mind. Well, especially when you have a top talent and you're looking for a top talent and all those three candidates have a top talent to bring it to the table. Now, only thing left is, is that, that the rest of the stuff that, that you know, suitability and uh, eligibility, all that stuff we got to test, right? So it's, it is a little bit, a little bit hard to make a decision, but, you know, tools like that, data like that, you know, makes the decision a little bit easier for you to take on. I'd say probably makes it um, noticeably easier. Very interesting. So any, any, you know, there was a lot of wisdom in your book. Definitely. I'm going to recommend everybody, you know, just get a copy of your book and go through it. You know, anything you want to share, because I know business leaders, a lot of them, they're trying to scale up their companies. They got to build the companies back and then they also got to take care of the teams as well. There's so many decision points. There's so many, so many items they have to accomplish over the next few years. Any word of wisdom that you, you, you will recommend that, you know, that they take on. This comes directly from the research on change management. And so they recommend that you only implement three changes, three big changes in an organization a year because of all of the energy that goes into the, the transition process. And that if you get people who are informal leaders who will champion the change, talk about it at the proverbial water cooler, mm -hmm. uh, help get other people enthusiastic and excited about the change. The likelihood of that change being successful is far stronger. And I know that uh, many leaders want to implement more than three changes, mm -hmm. but the problem is if you try to implement more than three, people are gonna put the brakes on. They're yeah. gonna resist. They're gonna say enough. I can't, I can't navigate more than three. So, I mean, that's a rule of thumb, two or four. I don't mean yeah. to be rigid yeah. about that, but I think that's useful for a business leader to know that when you implement that level of organizational change, each employee is going to go through some level of shock, denial, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anger, blame, uh, angst, sadness, yeah be in a mental fog yeah. until they can finally accept it. And then they start to move up the change model to full engagement again and new beginning. But yeah. uh, I mean, the whole reason I wrote the book was that I wanted it to become just known that when you implement a change, when it's thrust upon you, a change that people didn't necessarily want or ask for, that nobody is going to be on top of their game. Mm -hmm. That the people who are ordinarily functioning at 100% are going to find themselves slipping to about 65% effectiveness or engagement. Wow. I think that is vital for people to know. And I think it's vital for people not to think there's something horribly wrong with themselves when they're experiencing that. Mm -hmm. Because I think people can start to think, do I have early adult onset of Alzheimer's? Like, seriously, yeah. what is wrong with me? I can't remember my best friend's name. I can't remember this fact that I've always known. What is wrong with me? Well, especially the if message you got is, there's nothing wrong with you. You're yeah. in transition. Yeah. Try to be kind. 
especially when when you have a top players if you have a players they're performing so well and now you bring in a change in and they may not be performing the same levels they were performing before definitely is going to impact the confidence uh and 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 uh, you know how they perceive themselves and 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 a company and the teams absolutely very interesting so where can people learn from about you where can people connect with you shell um you know where, where how can they well with with where can they find the book as well uh the book is on amazon yeah. Um, do you want to see it? <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Perfect. Yeah, it's I'm going to include a link below there. Yeah, it's the Wisdom of Transition, Beautiful. Navigating Change at Work. Um, I won the the UK's Sound Advice uh, Book Awards for Best New Author of 2020. There were 14 nice. authors from 11 countries that were finalists in my book won. So um, pretty exciting. But anyway, there's a website the wisdom of transition.com uh there's my work website morphconsulting.com but amazon is where you buy it yeah i'm gonna include links to all those uh just below the video as well thank listen you. i i want to uh acknowledge you for thank you so much for spending time with me i learned so much from there's so many nuggets in your book there's so much wisdom um you know in, in your book i definitely recommend all business leaders who are watching you know listening to us you know, go get a copy of the book. You know, I think uh, it will, you know, definitely provide different perspective the way you look at a change and, and uh, you know, mindset and all those, you know, especially what we up against for the last couple of years, right? So you need the different yeah. perspective. So go get a copy of the book and definitely reach out to you for conversation, right? So um, who knows, you know, what what we, you know, that's how we collaborate, collaborate that's how we learn from each other. So, you know, I will recommend, you know, read a book and just reach out to for conversation, you know, and uh, maybe there's uh, room for collaboration. I'd love that. Thank you. Okay, good stuff. Thank you so much for time, Cheryl. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.